Uh, my name's Kit Downs. I'm a piano player. Um, I play at the Six. I'm lucky enough to play at the Six whenever Steve asks me and have done for a while. It's my first ever gig in London. And I'm happy to be talking about music. Uh, well, it was when I was still at college. Um, I went to the academy uh, in London and they used to run a night which they came up with Steve, which was giving young bands that were still at college a late slot on a Wednesday night and as an excuse to write some music or to get a band together or those sort of things that that you might not necessarily do if you're studying you know, by yourself all the time. So I did one of them, in fact I think I might have done the first one of them and I met Steve and I think maybe I'd met him before playing somewhere else at the Six as well but from then he started to give me regular things there which was great for me, I always had something to work for with my band and new music to write. It's a pretty rare thing to have any kind of regular gig <laughs> anymore um, just because there's more musicians than gigs. Yeah. So uh, I still value that as a place to play and it's also one of the few places that will uh, always guarantee you a fee, give you some food, um, it has its sort of own audience, you know, a lot of things that are good about it in a sort of old jazz club kind of way that don't exist in some other places. Yeah. Uh, so I'm happy to be there whenever I can. I'm doing a trio set with uh, Connor Chaplin and John Scott, which are people that I play with in other groups, but not necessarily my own. Ah, here's my cat. Um, not necessarily my own, so it would be nice for me to try out some of my own material with them, but as well do some standards and things, because I love playing them, and maybe some old blues songs and things. So, yep. something of that ilk. There's no correct way to hear it at all, so it's <laughs> totally however you want to hear it. But, um, I think maybe I just treat improvising as another tool to make music rather than it being the focus of the music. So sometimes it will be improvising, sometimes it will be completely freely improvised, or sometimes it will be off melody in a more sort of standards way, or sometimes the improvisation will be how you choose to frame your particular part that you've been given. So. It's all sort of, it's not ever one uh, ratio of improvisation to composition, it's always in flux. Um, and I, I'm kind of, in, I love composition as well, so it's, it's always a sort of moving tightrope between those two for me. And um, then finding musicians that feel comfortable in both areas. Um, I mean, I still love playing in that, uh, in that more sort of bebop way, like head solo, fours and things. Because that's its own language and it's very strong and it's great to reference and abstract as well because it's such a strong sound. So I do that in tunes as well. And I think I'm just interested in those. They're all methods but they're not necessarily the thing itself. They're all a means to get to this very broad thing that we call jazz. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm really... One thing I really like about playing with Sarah's band is it, it demands me to solo and accompany in a very different way to any other things that I do. Um, and for that, you know, I, I really love a lot of early blues music, um, like Muddy Waters or Howling Wolf or uh, Skip James and Blind Willie McDowell, those kind of old stompers. And, um, I've taken down some of that language on piano as well as some early boogie woogie things and I'm not an expert at it by any means but I just have an interest in it and it's really nice that in Sarah's band I get to draw on that pool of stuff that I'm really interested a lot because it's really relevant to Sarah's stuff. So um, you know I'm still improvising in the same way that I would in I don't know in Troika or 
another band that I'm in that's a very different aesthetic, but that it's still the same sort of um, feelings and process that's coming out, but it's just using a very different language. And I guess the the, um, the hard bit is being able to um, feel as free in any context as you do, you know, with you know, within Sarah's music or within Troika or within my own trio and playing standards and for it to feel still like you're just improvising or, or just playing music that you're not having to sort of change what you're doing to fit the context but more so just to pick a different language to say it. I think um, I'm always aware of tonality in a broad sense, so where you're starting out, where you're coming from, even if you're starting out in two different keys, you know, like your melody is an E and your bass line is in D. But if that's very strong, then it's very obvious that those two things are happening at once, and so that's almost like having one tonality, if you see what I mean. Because you're just starting out with something very strong, that just becomes one thing. And then it's a journey from there to somewhere else, maybe back again, you know, be referenced. That I'm, I'm always trying, when I'm writing music or playing music, to be very aware of the tonality at which I'm basing things from, even if I'm not explicitly playing it. But if, if it's referring to that thing, then hopefully they'll always feel to the listener like it's coming from something grounded and rooted in the song or, or in some kind of narrative where, that's, where the story starts. Um, what, but I have a really big love of classical music and especially very sort of chromatic harmonic music like you know, Wagner or, or Ravel or things that can change tonality with the flip of a switch mm. just from one note being common between two chords like the same pivot note and that's an increasingly, well that's always been a big part of jazz actually that whole um, like Ravel and Debussy that, that was a the influence from Gershwin very early on and even before that was always very, very strong. So I think that's just part of the language, you know, being able to... There's a tune called Conception, funny enough, which goes between the keys of D-flat and E, which I just said, which I didn't think, but maybe that's how I got it. But it starts off... A-flat. I mean it's not an enormous part of the, it's, it's just a sort of fleeting moment that it changes but that's kind of what's nice about it, it's just like wow, now we're in E, back to D, and then at the bridge it goes, tonality I'm really interested in, of how you can hint at other things but still feel rooted in your, your home key or your home keys. I'm sure I know it inside out but I, I did study it, yeah. I mean I, there's that sort of crazy period when you go to, I went to music school before that as well so I, I was studying um, in a quite academic way for about eight years or something like that when I was quite young um, which I had to kind of undo once I left and try and treat it in a more just intuitive way um, but you know I'm very glad as well to have really studied everything in depth um, the idea being that once it's really internalized you can call on it without having to think about why you're calling on it or why it's appropriate just feels appropriate and sometimes you can call on knowledge that you have from back of studying that uh, in the moment that you don't even use you just sort of feel it's there or something and then it's a choice to acknowledge it or not and I think um, I don't think you can get those kind of choices without studying in depth I think you can arrive at some other things if you don't study things with some very personal things but they're always uh, 
for better or for worse, limited to that thing, and you, you don't have the same choices. So someone like Skip James, for example, he never studied. He just came up with his own crazy way of playing guitar, and that's and his the way he sung. And I mean, I'm sure he did study in some way, but not in this academic music college way that we're talking about. Um, but he arrived at his own unique thing as a result of not doing it. But at the same time, it, it could only he could only do that one thing. He would never be able to expand his stuff out for a big band. If he, you know, yeah. presumed that he'd wanted to, which he probably didn't. So <laughs> it's all about having the tools for what you actually want to accomplish. And but I, you know, I like writing for big uh, ensembles and when I can, or, or writing in different ways, or using different musical languages. So in order to do that, you have to cross-reference things and have a sort of a reasonably big pool of stuff to, to go on. So. Although I think at the same time being too versatile can then dilute your thing down to a, a sort of common denominator yeah. which isn't then you anymore. So I think that the trick is to be versatile within the things that you actually really love. Yeah. Someone told me this really amazing Tom Rainey quote in Jazz Drummer. Um, and he was talking to a group of students that were coming up to play with him, with Julian Arguelles, I think it was as well. And um, people were coming up and calling tunes, and then sort of not really feeling very comfortable on them. Or, and he's just said, you know, you can't waste time playing things that you don't love. <laughs> Which seems like a sort of obvious thing to say, but then, then you think of it and it's like, well, do I really love this kind of music that I'm playing, or am I just doing it because it's difficult, or... Is keeping me in work, or you know, or these kind of things, and th and then you realise that if you do, if you're really um, disciplined about only doing the things that you actually really relate to and really love and feel important are important, uh, then you play a lot better all the time because you actually feel like you're doing something important to yourself. <laughs> I'm not sure, because um, the academy it was quite separate, the jazz and the classical courses, in fact totally separate, mm. um, in so much that I wanted to have classical lessons but I wasn't allowed classical piano lessons, which was really frustrating because I'd been to a music school before that had allowed me both and had treated it all as sort of the same music. So I, from those four years at Purcell School, which was the music school I went to, I'd been sort of taught to not think of them as separate things. And, and then actually at college they were treated as slightly separate things, maybe because you're getting marked and you have bigger numbers of people, I don't know, maybe it's a bit difficult to structure that, you know. But it, it, I think the, the classical thing comes more from um, just we're, we're European, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, we have a big history in that music. And I mean, now it, it's worldwide, everyone has a big history in that music, but I think you know, we have some very old music conservatoires here and very old con um, uh, concert halls and attitudes to classical music and I think uh, there are just more people into classical music um, everywhere really now, I guess, in, in America as well. But, um, it's just such a big part of the music. You can't take, you can't have jazz without classical music, because it's half of the pie, you know, <laughs> from the from the very onset of it. <laughs> yeah. I I really wouldn't even try to to say, but for for I don't know. I think jazz for me was like a, lang a particular language of music when I started it and I sort of, maybe I still treat it like that a little bit in that I wouldn't explicitly say that I play jazz but, but I do at the same time but it's not, you know, no one wants to sum themselves up with, a, with one genre <laughs> so, uh, you know, although I do play a lot of jazz and if forced at gunpoint I'd probably say I was a jazz pianist but at the same time you know, as you said, what is that word anymore? It's such an all-encompassing music, which is amazing. Um, I think it's a real 
tribute to the genre that it's so massive and so far-reaching and every it's almost like a sort of universal folk music now that everyone takes what they want from the origins of jazz and applies it to where they are with the people that they're doing it then and it becomes this new thing and I, I, that's what's so exciting for, for about it for me is that you can meet someone from anywhere around the world and they'll have their own bizarre viewpoint on what that is which is equally as bizarre as yours and so it, it doesn't belong to well it doesn't belong to anyone or any one place. <laughs>